Um, so perceptron, I'll kind of point out what perceptron does. <clears throat> so if you remember what perceptron was doing, perceptron was doing this update rule. Wt plus 1 was Wt plus um, x, well, let's call this the point that we get is x t y t um, at the t th iteration and let's say we make a mistake and this is the update that we did, right. Now, this update rule should remind you of a very, I mean, this is this looks very close to a standard gradient descent based update rule, right. So, where you, you have a guess for the current parameter of interest and then you take a gradient step in the negative gradient step. Right. So, that is a gradient update rule that people typically use. Um, now, if you use a hinge loss, right. So, let us think of using a hinge loss as usual. Um, well, hinge loss is something that we discovered from SVMs, which is loss of a particular w for a given data point x, y is just max of 0, 1 minus w transpose x into y. This is my hinge loss. Remember, it looks like this, right it looks like this. Um, now, if you look at the, let us say hinge, L hinge, if I take the derivative of L hinge or the gradient of L hinge um, with respect to W <coughs> or, or yeah, so with respect to W or maybe this, I can just write this as the gradient with respect to W. Um, now, how would that look like? Well, that looks like, so this is a piecewise linear function, right? So, it is, so this is, uh, this is W transpose x into y and this is the loss. This is, this is linear till 1 and then it is still linear, but then it is a different linear function from 1 onwards. So, if you look at the hinge losses gradient, right? So, if W transpose x into y is strictly less than 0, then it is this um, linear piece. Uh, whose slope is just w, right. So, uh, sorry, whose slope is just x into y, which means that minus x into y. So, because there is a 1 minus w transpose x into y. So, that is what this linear function is. So, in fact, this, uh, when this is less than 0, the slope would just be minus x into y. That would be your gradient. On the other hand, uh, if it is greater than, strictly greater than 0. So, then this is a constant, which means that the gradient is going to be simply 0 at that point. We do not have to care about the gradient there. There is no gradient update there. Um, now, at 0, uh, sorry, at, um, uh, yeah, when W transpose x into y um, is at 0, then what happens is the question. Uh, well, well, this is actually less than 1 for the hinge loss, but um, if you, if you can kind of think of this as, um, uh, yeah, so at so this value is one, this value is one. Um, so now, uh, if W transpose x into y exactly is zero, equal to zero, right? So then, um, actually, let me make a small change here. So this is going to be just this function, right? So it is going to be minus x y if w transpose x into y is less than 0. This is a modified version of hinge. It is going to be 0 if w transpose x y is greater than 0 and at w transpose x into y is 0. So, this function is not, you know, differentiable at this point because it is an intersection of two piecewise linear functions. Um, so, this we have to look at subgradients at this point and subgradients at this point can be any value between, you know, the slopes, these two slopes. Um, and these two slopes can be, you know, minus 1 to 0. I can pick any value between minus 1 to 0. For example, this is a subgradient, this is a subgradient and so on at this point, right. So, subgradient is a line that kind of completely is below this function at that point and uh, there are multiple lines that you can do. I mean, you can take a slope of between minus x into y till 0, any value is till a subgradient. Um, so, this would be a subgradient. Um, now, in our definition of perceptron, right, so now perceptron, I can, if you do a subgradient descent, then you could pick any one subgradient from this set, minus 1, 0 into x, y, and what perceptron does, it is makes a choice, it chooses um, minus x into y, right, so it chooses the value minus 1 
as the subgradient. Um, so which means that even if w transpose x into y is 0, this is going to be minus x into y, right. So which means that now what happens is, you know, when a new point comes in and you observe that you do not make a mistake, which means that w transpose x into y is greater than 0, then you do not do an update, which means that you are moving in the gradient direction, but then the gradient is 0, which means that you are not really making an update. On the other hand, if you make a mistake, which means w transpose x is less than 0 or w transpose x equal to 0, then you, you are assumed to make a mistake, right. So, uh, when mistake, right. So, when mistake, uh, comma 0 otherwise, right. So, then what perceptron does is it the gradient is minus x into y, which means that then the gradient update rule would be w t plus 1 is w t minus usual gradient update rule would be something like this loss at w t. This would be the usual gradient update rule, but then for perceptron, you know, this is minus x t y t. Now, which means that the gradient is minus x into y, which happens when in fact you make a mistake. This is the mistake case, right. Uh, but then eta t is set to 1 in case of perceptron. <coughs> what I am essentially trying to say is that um, now having seen this, we can interpret perceptron as if it is doing it is looking at one point at a time from my data set and doing a gradient descent or a sub gradient descent if, if there is no differentiability at the point that you have. Um, but it is taking a fixed step size of 1, right. So, this is the step size which is fixed to 1 in perceptron's case. If I fix the step size to 1 and if I take the gradient and if I imagine my loss as this modified hinge loss where you know you do not have this as actually you do not have this 1 minus basically. Right. So, this is the modified hinge, let us call this modified hinge, which looks like this. Now, you can interpret perceptron as if it is doing a subgradient descent on the modified hinge loss, where I am just taking a gradient step with the constant step size equal to 1, right. So, this is one way to, um, you know, I mean interpret uh, uh, perceptron, right. So, let me put that down. So, perceptron can be interpreted as, you know, well, because data points comes one at a time, you can think of this as a stochastic gradient descent problem, where instead of taking a gradient with respect to the entire data set, you are only taking it with respect to one data point, which can be randomly drawn, let us say. So, it is a stochastic gradient descent problem and then you are moving in the gradient direction that, that is dictated by this point, right. So, with, you know, this modified hinge loss. Um, with step size equal to 1, right. So, this is an interpretation, right. So, all we are saying is that we are kind of backfitting this, right. So, we put down perceptron algorithm uh, in a different, using a different motivation. What we are saying is that because SVMs minimize hinge loss, um, now, you can kind of look at that loss and see what perceptron does with respect to that loss and what we can also think of perceptron as it is doing trying to minimize the hinge loss, but not the 1 minus w transpose x, but then just max of 0 comma minus w transpose x y, but it is not minimizing the loss as an optimization problem over all data points. It is taking one data point at a time, which is equivalent to doing a stochastic gradient descent um, and it is moving in the gradient direction, but then it is also doing a constant step size. Right. So, with all these caveats, we can we can treat perceptron also as a loss minimization algorithm, um, but that is just a, in some sense a reverse fitting thing, right. So, you are kind of force fitting what perceptron does in the framework that you are actually trying to think about. But that is a good thing to also know because at the end of the day, it is doing something with the hinge loss because this update rule x t y t naturally, you know, fits with the hinge loss update, right. So, this is minus x t y t. So, that is why there is a w t plus x t y t that perceptron does. Yeah. So, this is one way to think of this. Um, now, 
similarly we can also interpret the boosting algorithm um, as if it is doing some kind of uh, optimization on what is called as an exponential loss again we won't really go into the details of how this exactly does um, here the loss can be thought of as for boosting Uh, the, because we did not prove the correctness of boosting in this course, uh, it would be hard to um, you know explain why this motivate this loss without proving the correctness. Uh, nevertheless, you can we can give some high level motivation, right? So the boosting can be thought of as the loss of a particular uh, h in, on a data point x comma y um, can be thought of as e power minus y into h of x, right? So this is what is called as an uh, exponential loss. It looks like the logistic loss, it's, though it is not the logistic loss, um, exponential loss. Um, now, you can view boosting as if you know you are trying to add um, a new classifier that kind of minimizes this exponential loss in every round, right. So, uh, basically uh, it is what is called as a coordinate descent algorithm. We would not really bother about that too much in this course, but um, all I want to say here is that you can also put boosting in this framework with some caveats like how we had we kind of force fit perceptron in this framework with some caveats. But the more natural thing um, that to understand and to appreciate is that you know these conclusions that we do which is that you know the standard algorithms like you know logistic regression SVMs and um, well not really the regression we never use regression for classification but then logistic regression and SVMs can be neatly interpreted as, as if you are using a convex surrogate uh, in place of the 0 1 loss. So, um, so these are all convex surrogates right. So, I would like to conclude this discussion by saying that this is these are all convex surrogates. The reason we why we want convexity is because you know we somehow want a function which has only one minimizer minimum and it is easy to find that minimum. Convex functions have only one minimizer and it is easy to find them and so they act as natural surrogates, um, choices for surrogates, right. So, and then different convex functions can be used and then depending on which convex function you get different algorithms. Of course, these are not the only convex surrogates, there are several other losses that you can come up with uh, and people have come up with different losses. For example, there is something called as a Huber's loss and so on and so forth, um, which also leads to different types of algorithms, right. Um, but there is another class of problems where you a class of algorithms where you do not you kind of give up on this convexity and you are you are still ok to end up getting a local minimum uh, and in practice such algorithms also perform you know comparably well with this uh, class of algorithms like SVMs and logistic regressions um, and these algorithms uh, are called as neural networks right. So, which does not have a convex surrogate, um, it, it is a completely a non-convex problem, uh, but still works well in practice and in fact, uh, it is also inspired by the perceptron algorithm. Um, so, in and, and it also has led to major advances in, in, in a subfield of machine learning called deep learning, which we are not looking at in this course, but a uh, future course, uh, I mean, uh, would cover something like that, um, especially if you are in this, uh, you know, online BSc program. Um, so, what we are going to see next is going away from this convex surrogates and briefly discuss this idea of neural networks. The goal is not to completely cover neural networks because that will be covered in a different course like from bottom up, uh, but just to give perspective with respect to whatever we have seen so far, um, we would talk a bit about neural networks which deal with the NP hardness in a slightly different way, right. So, which, which go away from convexity and what exactly are neural networks, how do they um, you know deal with this problem of uh, binary classification is something that we will start looking at next. Thank you.